welcome, welcome travelers. travelers. We we're, were aware that your journey was difficult, but prepare to have your questions answered, for you have been granted an audience with the Masters of Modern. And welcome back to the Masters of Modern Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Kessler, joined by my co-host, Ben Bateman. Just kidding. That's not really what's going on. I'm Ben Bateman, and that's Michael Grothy. We got kicked down Hello. the line from Alex, the the archon of the show, uh, and we're here now to fill the seats, and uh, we're here to talk to you guys about modern, because this is a podcast where we talk about modern. Actually, this is Michael Grothy. Let's give him a round of applause. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ben Bateman, and uh, as I mentioned, this is the Masters of Modern Podcast, so we're here to talk to you guys today about what's going on, the state of modern a little bit, with uh, the non-Hogak decks, what people are doing in the world that aren't just playing Leyland of the Void, and uh, there's some pretty cool stuff going on, so that is what we're going to be talking about today. Michael and I got to spend a pretty fair amount of time together at Gen Con. We talked about it last week, and uh, we've just been kind of unpacking all of the magic happenings over the last week. Um, Going to be at Vegas. Yeah, it's coming right up. Real excited about that. There is some exciting Masters of Modern stuff happening in Vegas. Is that right, Ben? That is. That is right. On the Friday night, we're going to be doing a live trivia show uh, hosted by Channel Fireball. Uh, We're going to be doing it at the main hall from 5 to 7. So some of you guys know that I compete in this thing called the Movie Trivia Schmodown. It's uh, the largest movie trivia league in the world. Kind of has a little bit of a WWE flair. So we're going to be taking that format, um, the, you know, the actual round structures and applying it to Magic the Gathering uh, and doing kind of an impromptu show. Uh, it is planned, but, you know, we're going to be doing it sort of in the main hall. There'll be other stuff happening, but hopefully hopefully it should go pretty well. We've got some awesome, awesome competitors. We've got some wizard employees, you know, some cosplayers. Uh, I think it's going to be really, really fun. So Alex and I will be hosting that. I will not be competing. Uh, I won't be trying to flex my trivia muscles. I used to be good at Magic trivia. I don't think so anymore. You know the old cards. I know the old cards, but I definitely found, like, uh, I definitely have found that stuff from the last five years, card names, they don't stick with me like they used to. I used to know card names like the back of my freaking hand. If you ask me, like, card names from Plane Shift, I got it on lock. You start to ask me, like, wow, you start Plane to ask Shift. Me, <laughs> That's not even me. in modern. Why do you even talk about Plane Shift cards? I just, like, old stuff stuck with me, right? <laughs> but if you start to ask me about, like, combat tricks from 2016, nothing. Well, right. sure. I mean, combat tricks. You have to play a lot of limited and no combat tricks. That's yeah. the. I mean, I've played a good amount of limited. If you ask me any M20 card, like a, the name of a combat trick, I don't know it. I played sure. four drafts last week. Like Sure. Yeah. You know? So there you go. But uh, I know, I still know what I know. Maybe maybe I'll, I'll, I'll train up. And if this thing ever takes off, I'll, I'll compete. You think you'd be any good at uh, Magic Trivia? Me? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Really? I, well, I worked at a shop for a long time. So I sorted a lot of cards and I just ended up knowing them through that. And then also I play a lot of limited. I've played, I've drafted like almost every week, at least uh, since like Scars of Mirrodin. Hmm. So I, I know like all the random commons and stuff from those sets for the most part from draft. And then also like picked up a lot sorting cards and buying collections and stuff. You have to go through a lot of cards, look at a lot of cards and Every once in a while, I'm flipping through, and there's like a weird card I've never seen before. Read it, and so I just right. kind of familiarize myself with a lot of cards from that. I got to keep you on your toes throughout the episode. I'm just going to throw trivia questions at you. No, I'm not really going to do that. <laughs> That'd be mean. <laughs> um, but uh, we are going to talk to you guys today about some of the cool stuff going on. We're going to start a little bit with news, and before we get into news, I do want to remind everybody here that's watching or listening, please hit that like, subscribe, comment button here on YouTube. It is the best thing you can do to stay up on what we're doing. If you happen to be listening on audio, go and leave a review, a rating, what you think about the show. Sometimes we do giveaways and other things like that. There's a couple cool places online you can find us. We have a Twitter, which is at the MMCast. I have a Twitter. It's at Ben Bateman Media, as well as like an Instagram and other things. Michael has a Twitter. Uh, at Dudard, D-U-D-A-R-D-D. Yep. And, and Alex, who's Alex, not here. You can find him at Kess Wiley. At Kess Wiley. Last week's episode was titled on YouTube that it was Alex and Michael talking. And yeah. Wow, you got cut out. Yeah, I got cut out, which is why, which is why I did what I did it's earlier. It's been corrected. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, those are all good places you can find us. The other cool thing you guys can do to support us if you want to help kind of keep growing the show is patreon.com slash the MMcast. Um, there's, a, there's a Discord server there that we post deck lists in. There's a bunch of other cool stuff that we do on the actual Patreon. And, and most, more than anything, it's just the single best thing you guys can do if you want to help support the growth of the show because we did hire a producer. You can hear him off camera. His name's Marshall. He's wonderful. You forgot um, his microphone, but you can maybe hear him. Yeah. <laughs> He's frowning. He looks menacing. Oh, he's so angry. Look at him. I definitely can't be blocked by fewer <laughs> than two creatures. <laughs> 
menace. Funny. Um, so, uh, so uh, those are a couple of the uh, the quick shout outs there. The last one is to be sure to check out the command zone. Uh, Josh and Jimmy do great stuff. They do game nights, extra turns. They, they do amazing content, uh, and they are the sister show to what we do here. So check that stuff out. Let's talk a little bit of news. GP Minneapolis happened. Of the top eight decks, five of them were Hogak decks. And the most played card in... The most played card in all of the whole GP was Leyline of the Void. Similar to the Pro Tour. Now, what's interesting is that uh, Leyline of the Void was getting played. Uh, I think I talked about this on the on the podcast when we were discussing the Pro Tour. Um, it was one of the reasons that people were playing in the main deck at the Pro Tour is because there were open deck lists. So it was like a good main deck card that you could just mulligan away because uh, the London Mulligan is a powerful way to mulligan. If you mulligan into a ley line, you can put it on the bottom, as opposed to drawing a six-card hand with a ley line is brutal. Drawing a seven-card hand with a ley line when you don't need it, you put it on the bottom. So it's open deck list, so game one, your ley line's useful. Plus, London Mulligan makes it a little bit easier. So it kind of made more sense that it would be the most played card, because it, like, mulligans well. So at the, at, uh, the Mythic Championship... Uh, it was modern, and you knew what your opponent's deck list was going to be. You had their entire 60, and their 75 cards, uh, their their 15-card sideboard would just be names of cards. You wouldn't have amounts. So it would say, you know, Leyland of the Void, Assassin's Trophy, Naturalize, or not Naturalize, that, Nature's Claim, or whatever. Whatever the sideboard was, it would just be card names. You wouldn't know how many, but you would know, like, their entire 60-card list uh, with numbers. And so when you sat down at the table, you look at your opponent's deck list. Everybody's deck list was registered beforehand uh, for presumably coverage purposes so that they could easily feature players and have their deck list on the overlay uh, when you were watching on Twitch. And... Uh, so you, when you saw your pairing, you could look up your opponent's deck list so because yeah. they were all they were all available. Um, and people weren't playing at main deck at Minneapolis because no open deck list. You don't know if you need it game one, but it still being the most played card, uh, given you know just normal GP rules, is pretty rough. So I think it's just like the the Hogak deck is so fast that you know Nile Spellbomb or like. Some of these Relic of Regenitus, some of these like Grave Hate cards that people will play because they're a little bit slower, but you have some time. You don't have any time and it has to be their whole graveyard. So because <laughs> yeah. of the delve, like, you, you know, if you surgical extraction, a, a blood gas or something, they don't care because their graveyard is still stocked and they'll just cast Hogak from their hand. And- now, the red <laughs> prowess list that showed up here third place, uh, it's the only deck in the top five that is not a Hogak deck. Um, the Red Prowess list, is this the same Red Prowess as like basically Red Phoenix? Is that what? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good deck. Uh, Skull Scar, Soul Scar Mage, yep. Monetary Swiss Spear. Yep. You play um, a bunch of spells and you're attacking for like four on turn two and stuff like that, right? Yeah, I mean, so when, when I went to Portland last December, uh, my brother played the Mono Red Phoenix deck. Oh, so which, this is not playing, this is no Phoenixes. Okay. That's, no that, Phoenixes that's, in this that's deck. What I was that's why it's about. Prowess and not Phoenix. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's it's very similar to the Phoenix deck. It's just not playing Phoenix. It's still playing the four Metamorphos, four Light Up the Stage, four Crash Through that you often see in the Phoenix deck. So you like have a critical mass of like cantrips. Yep. But uh, no Phoenix, just four Bedlam Reveler, four Swift Spear, four Soul Scar Mage. Faithless Loot? Uh, yeah, four faces. That's it's pretty... just the best cantrip in the format if yeah. you're playing red. Hundred percent. It is interesting though. <laughs> like, you, like you wouldn't play crash through before you would play faithless looting. I don't think in any deck ever. <laughs> is this deck really better without Phoenix? I think it's a tech against the void. Yeah, just because you, you get to dodge all of the grave hate that everybody's grave running. Hate. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's so that's the one. That's the only deck in that top five. You've got a couple different lists here. Justin uh, Justin Plocker Plocher won the event uh, playing Hedron Crab Hogak. There was another Hedron Crab Hogak listed at fifth. You have Burn in sixth place, Humans in eighth, and the rest are all going to be variations of Hogak. Um, uh, you know, this is kind of like the modern we expect right now. Yeah. Um, uh, the, interestingly, I so it looks like the Humans do not have any, any uh, Grave Hate. They have two Grafteer's Cage in their sideboard. That's it. I guess they're relying on like Reflector Mage. To be I mean, Hogak. Reflector Mage is sweet against Hogak. Reflector Mage is certainly sweet against Hogak. Yeah, that's really um, good. So I guess that's their big plan. The uh, the red deck is playing four Surgicals. Makes sense. Um, Spells, yeah. And a Tormod's Crypt, which Tormod's Crypt is more or less like if you're only have room in your sideboard for one Leyline, you play one. I'd be interested to know, I guess because Surgical Trigger's Prowess, 
is probably the reason that they're playing it over ley line. Like it gives them some speed oh, as well as a hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an additional spell, and also Tormod's Crypt. That's that's the other reason because Tormod's Crypt because prowess is not instant or sorcery; it's non-creature. So Tormod's Crypt still still triggers prowess. Right, that's right. Well, and also like prowess. if you play one ley line of the void in the deck where you can't cast it, you're pretty unlikely to have it in your opening hand. And exactly. if you draw it, it's brutal. But Tormod's Crypt, it's like you draw it on turn three. Maybe it's too late, but it does something. Ley line of the void is just blank. It seems pretty fast. Um, I don't love the idea of having to like throw your throw having to throw your red creatures against a hogak if like that deck seems like it probably has trouble winning if they can get big things out and just hold them back like i don't see the deck has reach is part of the benefit i mean it's playing um it's playing two burst lightning and then four lightning bolt four lava spike so it has just like a lot of burn to the face plus four lava dart so I, I get the feeling that you are planning on just like playing a one drop every single game and then turn two, just like hitting them for as much damage as possible and then trying to burn them out. That yeah, makes sense. Using like light up the stage to kind of refuel, metamorphose and crash through and Faithless Looting Bedlam all Reveler. dig. Yeah. All dig to more burn. Bedlam Reveler digs to more burn. And you can just kind of like try and live through the Hogak uh, long enough to just burn them out once yeah. you stick some early damage on them. I'm sure on the draw against a fast Hogak start, you still just lose, period. Like, yeah, but I mean, that's just that's the reality of. So Aaron Forsyth came out on Twitter and said there would be no emergency bans before Vegas. So we are going to go into GP Vegas. Um, now, our show is on that Friday, which means that I'm not going to get to play in the Modern Constructed event. I'm going to play in the Modern Horizon Sealed event on Saturday. It's the same one you're going to be in, right? Yes, I'm also going to be in the Modern Horizon Sealed. Hogak is legal in that format, but uh, <laughs> not everybody's going to be playing four. So. There's, is, there's no, there is no possibility of a turn two Hogak in Horizons Limited, right? It's impossible. Uh, I'd have to look at the cards, but I doubt it. I can't imagine, right? Like that you don't have. You can't get five. I think five cards in your graveyard and two creatures into play on turn two is rough because there's no citrus supplier. Like citrus supplier is the big the turn two need. enabler. Or the other or well, or Seder Wayfinder, or Glow Spore, Something or Hedron like Crab. Yeah, yeah. You you need like a a one or two mana creature that puts a ton of cards in your graveyard, and I don't think Modern Horizons has that. So you have like Prismatic Vista gets you <laughs> <laughs> double Prismatic Vista. Turn one and turn two. Okay, that gets two cards that in your gets graveyard. Two, yeah, you get a. I don't. I, you need two bodies, and then a ransack the lab puts the, the rest of the graveyard cards yeah, in your graveyard. Yeah, carry feeder. I get nothing. Yeah, no, there's nothing. All right, so uh, guys, that's that's what's going on there. Uh, Forsyth has come out and said there would be no emergency ban, so you're gonna have to play in the Hogak world at Vegas. It and feels like post Vegas. It's just a foregone conclusion, right? Hogan, yeah, I mean Hogan the big banned. the big emergency. Uh, yeah, I think so. The, the big emergency ban discussion is some people are like Hogak is obviously ruining the format, and Vegas is like a big marquee event where you want to kind of, kind of show off a little bit because there's going to be so many people going. Um, because it's it's like in Vegas, they always they're doing multiple GPS. There's like going to be tons of content creators there, kind of like tons of like peripheral commander stuff and peripheral cosplay artists all that type of stuff so this is like a big marquee event you would think that they would want to shake up the format a little bit to increase attendance but the downside of an emergency ban like this is that most people who are going to vegas already bought their deck and if you bought into hogak because you wanted to play it at vegas that's terrible to get it banned two weeks before i mean that's just so disheartening i mean i get that like you're the bad guy because you're playing hogak but it's just that's the game right like it's been like a short it's been you know when the ban window is you know that you should be safe you should be able to spend money on cards and take them to a tournament and it's just really rough if it gets banned right out from under you at like a random time but when hogak gets banned you're still gonna be able to play a dredge of vine list like you're still gonna be able to play something right yeah but you might not it's decide not that that's the best meta choice right i mean yeah. like dredge will still be good for sure um and in fact people will be playing less grave hate so there will probably be a period of time where dredge is still just great because people are like oh i'm taking these ley lines out of my sideboard and then it's like ha 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 still gotcha but yeah it's not it you know given testing and everything else it's just going to be it, it sucks to ban a card like that at such short notice i think yeah i agree especially when it's not scheduled got a point from marshall i'd like to point out that you can cast turn two hogak in a uh, limited off of stream of thought that blue Common cost one blue. Oh, you yeah. mill yourself Target and then you play. Mills the top four cards in their library. You may shuffle up to four cards from your graveyard into your. So library. you mill yourself on turn one for four, and then four. it goes in your graveyard. So you have a fifth five, card, five, so and you play two one drops. Yeah, carrying feeder, two carrying feeders. <laughs> All right, we did it. It's possible. We, we broke Nimble. the format. <laughs> Drinker. Oh yeah, There's so many. <laughs> oh, I like the nimble like, yeah. mongoose hogak combo. <laughs> if this is in my uh, sealed pool, I'm absolutely playing it. <laughs> I 
I mean, Nimble Mongoose does give you another reason to play Stream of Unconscious. Though. I yeah. guess so. So bad. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about some of the some of the hot decks that have been uh, you know winning leagues online and and five owing. There's a lot of really really cool variety. Um, there's a lot of people doing really fun stuff, which we don't get to see a lot of in like the marquee events. And I think you're probably going to see more of post banning. But definitely some really really interesting and very cool cards in here. I think the big card is Arkham's Astrolabe. That seems to be the card that's enabling a lot of like multicolor, really cool stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's like a good fixer. There's good reasons to play Snowlands and and it's like a one mana cantripping artifact, which I think like, you know, after Hogak gets banned, the big decks that are probably going to take center stage are uh, like Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix and Humans. Yeah, Phoenix, Humans, there's probably going to be some form of Dredge Vine that's still good. Yep. Questionable whether it'll be like tier one or, or just right behind and then um and actually this urza yeah uh urza were decks uh, really which are playing astrolabe so that's why I, I wanted to talk about this while we're talking about astrolabe because i think that like once Hogak gets banned uh the urza Astro- there is an astrolabe deck that i think will be tier one i think probably blue eye control also oh yeah blue eye control is always blue eye is always going to be good i mean the two to fairies are such game changers it's so crazy how different it's so crazy how different modern is now compared to a year ago in the sense of blue eye control. Just when they were like, yeah, you know that really legendary character? We're not going to give you one. We're going to give you two of them. And they're both going to be super competitive modern playable. Like, insane. That's insane. Well, I know. It, it was like Jace got unbanned right, be- right like after Teferi got printed. And then, so you got Jace and Teferi. Then they printed Narset and, T- and Teferi three mana. So now you, you got like in the last two years, you got... Four planeswalkers printed that just like slot directly into the deck easily. <laughs> well, here's a question for you. Here's a question for you. All right. So 10 is the most perfect magic card ever. Powerful Black Lotus. Okay. Zero is unplayable. Five is a dead average card. What number do you assign to those four planeswalkers? How good are they? In modern specifically. Like a five, like a planeswalker that's a five in terms of like modern power level is probably like four mana Elspeth like a generally very good card it's not really playable in modern but it's, it's certainly an average power level it's sure really good if you cast it that has game, gotten played before you can win with it if you cast that in a game of modern the person doesn't look at you and go I can't believe you're playing that bad card they're just like huh Elspeth yeah Elspeth is cool good card <laughs> um that's probably a four I would say in terms of power level but I'm just curious how you rank them and like what's the most powerful what's the least powerful where do you where do you think you place them yeah, I don't. That's that's a that's a, that's a really tough question. I mean, let's talk it through. So, do are we in agreement? Probably still that Mind Sculptor is the most powerful of the four cards. Maybe not. Uh, it's tough, right? Yeah, it is tough. I mean, I think Jacer Jacer to Fairy five mana are probably the most powerful. Um, like they don't really ask anything of you to be good in your deck, which is I think one of their big power, like a big piece of their power level, like, um. To fairy three mana, you kind of like. I mean, I guess it's like generally good, but it definitely gets better if you build around it a little bit. And Nar said, obviously, you have to have your deck built in a certain way to even like make it playable. Um, so yeah, I would say that Jason to fairy are contenders for for the top slot, and then I think I would put Narset below them, and I'd put. Three minutes to ferry below that. Interesting. So you think Narset is the third, and three minutes to ferry is the least powerful of the four? Yes, I think so. I think that like Narset is the most rewarding of any of these if you build around it in the way that there's like the Narset puzzle box, Narset like puzzle deck. box combo decks and stuff like that. I it also just like invalidates a lot of strategies. I mean, so does to ferry three mana, but I think that Narset providing like immediate card advantage is really valuable. I also think, but I also think with Narset, one of the things that's so powerful about the card is that you, a lot of the things that people do to catch up in modern Narset invalidates. So, I mean, modern is such a, it's a, such a format of margin, right? Like you're, most of what you're doing is you're, you're just getting a little bit of advantage or a little bit of tempo. It's not like legacy where, there's a lot of situations where you'll just like win on turn two. Like if the game, you just end the game, if you well, get a string of cards, you'll just, sometimes you just end the game when you play turn two Hogak, but I know I, what you mean. I mean, there is, there is a currently deck <laughs> yeah, yeah. modern that, that does that, but like yes. historically modern is modern, pretty fast, but there are, yes, there's a lot of situations where the game is going to come down to, to incremental advantage. Yeah. 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 And so I think it, it comes down to like, often it's like the player, the draw or something like that, or, or a well-placed thought or something like that. And so if you, 
if you prevent them from being able to cast Serum Visions or their Faithless Looting doesn't do anything because you just played this three mana card that generated some advantage, there's a lot of decks that are just like looking at their hand after that thought sees and they're like, well, now all of the things that I wanted to do that I could have done that were going to maybe get me back in this just won't do anything. And there are decks like, I mean, there are decks like humans where like they're not going to care as much. Like they're just going to just draw a lot of gas. That's what the deck does. But there's a lot of decks that need to be able to draw cards. Yeah. I mean, blue white control does not do very well if you play a Narset against them. Like they're going to slow down. Yeah. They, they don't have a good way to pressure it. No, they have to. And so I think that that's where. It's like Teferi Tuck is there out. Yeah. But they have generally. to get there. So like my question though is if five is average power level are all, f- how how far above five are those four cards? Is Jace a 10? Well, if, if, no, no way Jace is a 10. I mean, it's tough because like some of these, like, you know, you have like power nine level cards at 10, but then what does that make nine? Is nine like... GTA or something like that? Like yeah, something. is nine like Chrome Mox the modern like ban that. list? Is it like Maybe, yeah. GTA, Chrome Mox? You know, some of these are like, like Hypergenesis I don't think is super powerful. It's just like... I think like Chrome Mox, Mox Diamond, like what you're talking about, like where you don't reanimate do from Tempest is like, sure. Is that like an eight or a nine? You it's have like really survival powerful. of the fittest, you know, like Mox Opal is really powerful, but like you have to jump through a lot of hoops to make a Mox Opal work. But it's yeah, really like, powerful. like the best cards in modern, where, where do they lie? Are they like an eight or a nine? Like Bolt is like a nine probably, right? Bolt is a nine. You put like Bolt, like as powerful as like wheel as wheel of fortune, a nine or a 10. Or like survival of the fittest, well, or again, like I did say, banned in legacy cards. I did are those say, tens? I did maybe say in judge, modern. Okay, what's ten? Maybe instead of judging along cards that aren't relevant, you should pick what is a ten in, in modern. Right. That's sure. why. I so asked. like bolt thoughtsies are tens. Yeah, the, probably those are like the pillars of the format. They're for cost. Path you're to getting. exile. Yeah, if those are all tens, what's mind sculptor? Nine. Not as good. I don't think Mind Sculptor is as good of a card as those cards because it costs four. I could put it as like an eight. Okay. I think I think, I'd, I think, I think Jason Pat's Teferi are close enough. You think Pat's not a ten? I think Pat's a nine. If we're talking because, sure. because there are plenty of white decks that don't play Path because they don't want to give that. That is true. Time jump to I don't know if Bolt or Path is a ten. Honestly, I think Thoughtseize is Thoughtseize a ten. Is a 10. Thoughtseize is good against almost anything in modern. There's I don't think that there's ever a period in modern's entire history where more Thoughtseize have been played than Bolt. Bolt is just the best card. Yeah. Like, I love Bolt. <laughs> I mean, I, it's fair. Bolt is the best card in the format. I'm a big Bolt supporter. I feel like if I'm saying five is average power level, I can't put three mana to ferry anything less than like seven. It feels like it's probably an eight. Sure. I think, I think where I'm at is Jace, Jace and Teferi are at eight. I I think they're too close in power level. They're not a full number worth of power level apart, I don't think. And I I think I would put Narset into Fairy three mana at seven. I think I jump a point ahead of you on both. I think I go nines and eights. I think I go. I think I go. Jace is a Jace is a nine. To Fairy's a nine. Narset's an eight. And it's possible To Fairy's a seven, but it's possible it's an eight. I think those. I think like the blue white planeswalkers are so good. Like and the power level on those cards is pushed so hard. I don't even think we're totally aware yet of how much better they are than what we had before, and how much better they're going to be than a lot of what we get in the future. It's just they're also fresh for the most part, other than Jace. Sure. Yeah, um, especially the War of the Spark ones. I mean, there was a very short period of time before War of the Spark and Modern Horizons, and those cards were putting up results. But I, I think I agree with you that I don't think we saw those cards full potential before. Modern Horizons came and just like totally blasted the format with tons of great cards. Urza, Renin 6, Hogak. And now that the dust is clearing a little bit and the meta is, you know, obviously the meta is dominated by Hogak. And if there's a ban in that direction, which I think it's safe to assume there will be, yep. um, you know, the, the meta game is going to have to stabilize again around we'll see. And, and we'll see how powerful these blue and white planeswalkers are. I mean, the one thing that makes me think that they're not just nines is I feel like cards that are as powerful as a nine and a 10 in modern, you will see in multiple decks. And I feel like, fair point. like Jace shows up in other blue decks as like a one or two of, because he's, he's only with single color, which I think is very valuable, but Narset to fairy and, and both Teferi's actually have not really reached that level where they just are showing up. Like people are playing like Bant Noble Hierarch decks with like one Teferi at the top end. Like you, you they're basically just blue white control cards. 
I don't think that's true. I think that I've seen them show up in other contexts, just not at the level I would expect to see a nine or a 10. I feel like eight is like role player, right? Like eight is like very strong role player that like, uh, like Arclight Phoenix would be an eight, right? There's like one deck for Arclight Phoenix, but it's a very powerful card. But it's highly powerful. Okay. That's a fair, that's a fair assessment. And I think I would place Jason to fairy on the power level of like Arclight. This actually feels like an episode. This feels like Alex when he's here next, we need, Oh, Alex, Alex would be all over this. We need to establish the modern power scale. I think this is a real episode of, 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 of the masters of modern. Oh, wow. It's been birthed live. I feel like it is. Are we in agreement about this? I feel this feels like a conversation to be had. Like I need to know, like where, where is mere superior on this list? How powerful is mere superior? (laughs) It's it's less than a five for sure. Sure, less than a five. No way. It's a five six for two. Okay, okay. We'll 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 continue later. I think. Uh, all right. I want to talk about some of these cool decks that we're seeing pop up. So, um, really quickly before I get into all the lists, I do want to remind everybody here, just because this is this is very important to me. Um, New York, August 29th, I'm going to be doing a live show. You guys know that I have this brand. I do Action Industries, Andrew Guy and myself. We are going to be performing the New York Comedy Club, 10, 15 p.m. So if you're in the New York area and you want to come hang out, we're going to do like a meet and greet thing afterwards, get drinks with people. Um, it's going to be really fun. Uh, there's going to be like dumb Nicolas Cage impressions and uh, Tom Cruise stuff. And, and and we're going to be doing a review of the movie MacGruber because we love MacGruber. And uh, I might even play a live song because I'm playing music again. That's the thing we're talking about. Not sure. But be sure to get your tickets now, New York Comedy Club. Dot com um, and uh, there's a special discount code if you DM me I'll send to you so you can get the, uh, the the better deal on the tickets but um, yeah thank you for listening guys and, and I really hope to see somebody there I can't wait it's gonna be a really fun show so let's talk about sweet magic decks um, I want to start with the one here that jumped out at me the fastest because I was so hyped on it yep and it's this four color Sahili list because yep. you know how bad I've wanted to make Sahili work in modern for as long as I have so yep. This is a five zero. Uh, let's see here. Do we have the uh, the user name? Uh, looks like a Daz Dazro twenty. Um, this list plays four Sahili Ray, four Teferi Time Laver, and three Ren and Six. There is Teferi Time Raveler showing yeah, up. Yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty hyped on this. Like just the idea that I get eight powerful three mana Planeswalkers and also get to play three Ren and Six. So uh, as you would imagine, the list also plays four Felidar Guardian, four Ice Fang Quaddle. One Vanillion Click, four Wall of Blossoms, four Birds of Paradise, four Path of Exile, four Arkham's Astrolabe, and Sleeper Hit, four Oath of Nyssa. And then a whole bunch of, uh, looks like fetches and shocks and, and basic snowlands and stuff like that to make your Astrolabe work. Yeah, so, I mean, it makes sense that you want to play cards that synergize with the blink effects. Sahili's effective blink effect and Felidar's actual blink effect. So you're playing the the Quaddles and the Wall of Blossoms to dig through your deck to get to the combo. Yep. You got Astrolabe to help you dig to the combo. You got Othanissa to help you dig to the combo. It's interesting that they opted for like mostly non-blue card selection since it's a blue deck. I mean, yeah. No Serum Visions, no... Well, that's so. That's something I've learned because I've tried to play Sahili in a lot of decks, uh, both in Modern and in Highlander. And what I've learned about the card is that basically you want to make sure everything you're doing is a permanent because Felidar Guardian is the other card in the deck, and so Felidar Guardian sense. plays really well with permanents. Oh, that's so, true. You can flicker Nose of Nissa with Felidar Guardian. It's kind of the whole idea, right? Is that if you're going to play Felidar Guardian, you want to win with Sahili, but it's a pretty fragile combo. It's very easy to disrupt. So well, that's why I like to Fairy Time Raveler here as well because it it protects your combo exactly. from being disrupted. And I was saying when Teferi came out and we first were just seeing it in in blue white decks, I think I said it on on the show um, that I think that this is like an interesting home for Teferi decks like this that are looking to do like sorcery speed combos on their own turn where you can just have a Teferi out to make sure that your combo is protected. But it's also something that you can run out on turn three or on turn two with the Birds of Paradise and going to just sit there ticking up or it can like bounce a Hogak or something and dig to your combo. But then when you're actually comboing, this Teferi that's been sitting there all game doing basically nothing is now suddenly like winning you the game. It's a powerful card. It makes you realize really quickly when you're playing against a really good reactive player just how powerful Teferi is. Um, you know, yeah. we, we had a we had a Highlander event recently where I won with Painter Servant Grindstone combo against Gavin Verhey. And Gavin was playing straight up blue control, like all counter spells and interaction. And I literally just early in the game resolved my Teferi, and he was like I have to now find a way to answer your planeswalker fast enough to stop you from killing me with like demonic tutor combo. And I, and he didn't, and it yeah. came over and, uh, I was blown away by just how good to is. It just single handedly won me the game. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not going to do that in every matchup, but I think when you're like a deck who's 
only real wing con is comboing because like there's one creature in the entire deck with more than one power. None of the planeswalker ultimates are going to win you the game. So you are completely reliant on comboing. I think it's like reasonable to protect your combo from disruption with, uh, with a with a Deferi. If you have other win conditions, like if you're if you're like a devoted druid combo deck, I could see Teferi working out in your deck, but you don't need it as much because you already kind of right. have a backup plan in the form of just beating them up with, you know, two and three power creatures and walking blisters and stuff. Um, what, um, one other thing that's interesting about Teferi is because everything is a permanent, he also more or less has a blink effect. You can return up to one target artifact creature enchantment to its owner's hand. So you can return your Osanissa, you can return your Arkham's Astrolabe, you can turn return your Wall of Blossoms to dig towards your combo if you need to. And uh, Astrolabe and Oath of Nissa in particular only one mana, so you can just like play Teferi, minus, get that back, play it for only one mana. and like Yeah, your net loss is really, really, so, uh, really low. What's the Ren and Six doing here? There's three run and six here, and I'm looking at it. I'm thinking like, I mean, I guess you have your prismatic vista, and you have like your your misty rainforest, and you just get your fetches back. There's a lot of talk about run and six. Uh, I've seen on Twitter about run and six maybe being at a higher power level than is appropriate for modern, uh, and it hasn't really proven itself because Hogak yeah. is so dominant, and the decks that would be interested in run and six are generally like going to struggle against an 8-8 with Trample on turn two, like most decks. Um, but also, like, dredge decks tend to have a great matchup against mid-range decks because you just are, you come out of the gate fast and your threats are extremely resilient. And so the mid-range decks would be interested in Ren and Six, like this one, basically. I mean, the, um, I guess what's interesting about it, right, is like, so Ren and Six does two things really well. Um, the, f- the fact that it costs two means that if you run it out, get back a fetch land, you don't really care like if they kill it after that you're fine you've cycled you got me back a land so now you're hitting your land drop and it it goes up to a pretty high loyalty right it goes up to four goes up to four and you plus it so it gains you four life and rampant growth yeah so well it doesn't rampant growth because it doesn't put it into play but it gets you the land back and so i think what's really interesting about that is like we all know that sorry maybe 30 percent of games in magic you're going to lose to mana screw it's just you're going to miss two land drops and lose so already the fact that this does a dark confidant impression and just draws you the extra card, but specifically draws you lands and you don't take any life for it is already pretty valuable. Now, secondly, especially if you're in a deck like this, that's going to take advantage of blinking run and six to get a loyalty back up. It also can kill a birds of paradise. It can kill a noble hierarch. It's yeah. very good against humans. It's good against like kills any infect creature. Most affinity creatures kills, um, kills a dark confidant. If you're kills a Vendillion click. So at two, that's the thing. Is if, if Ren and Six costs three, I still think people would play it because it's still really powerful. Yeah. It's just the fact that it costs two. Turn two in modern is such a specific and such an interesting turn because like that's kind of your throwaway turn. You know you probably won't die on turn three. There are some decks now that do it, but like classically modern was designed so that you would you would have until the fourth turn to kind of stabilize and figure out what you were doing. So you could you could functionally play your Tarmogoy for you know, you could play your Dark Confidant, you could play your your uh, young pyromancer or whatever it is, the thing that you want to be doing. That's kind of the point. And so the fact that you're getting a planeswalker that they have to look at you and be like, if I don't respond to this he's not gonna he's not gonna flip uh you know a, a gurmag angler and take yeah seven. i mean it's a, he's it's, not a gonna... it's a turn two threat more or less that that like demands an answer and there are no efficient answers really i mean like assassin's trophy is kind of the only one but if you play ren and six get back a fetch land then the assassin's trophy you get a land into play they're like so far ahead i, I mean it's just like it demands an answer or it's just going to like draw you a card every turn and yep. sometimes kill your opponent's stuff and maybe ultimate. And it just does so much for only for such a low investment that if you just play it on turn two, I think it's like really hard for your opponent to, to come to parody at yeah. that point. It seems like in this deck, the thing that it's doing really is it's just powerful enough that you want to be playing it. It's blinkable, but it also is helping you hit your land drops and make sure that you have your colors because it's a four color yeah. deck. So the big, because you're playing fetch lands, it's just going to help you make sure. Well, you don't. Right. And like in a lot of these snow decks, you are pretty reliant on fetch lands because you want to be grabbing basics because you need the snow mana. And yeah. so, um, or snow permanence, I guess in the case of you need snow mana for astrolabe or snow permanence for, for quotal. So your first few turns, you're probably fetching basics. Um, and in order to do that, yeah, you're going to be using fetch lands because that's the best way to get basic the basic that you need in a four color deck into play. Is you're playing prismatic vistas and you're playing other fetches. It is definitely fascinating that we're talking about run and six, but the other things in this list, four wall of blossoms and four Arkham's astrolabe, they're just two more ways for two mana or less to efficiently draw cards in modern. And like yeah, so and much of Nissa. Yeah, so much of what the format's about. So let's jump across now to another deck. I want to look at this this 50 list from uh, Plichow. This is a uh, this is a list that uh, is being called Budget Twiddlestorm, right? 
Yeah, yeah, because uh, it's uh, is is it is it budget? I guess this one. Uh, the, in general, it's just a budget. Yeah, this one is budget. It's not playing fetches. It's not playing fiery islets. It's uh, it's just playing three spire buff canal, two steam vents, two shiv and reef. Is like it's dual lands, and then it's got lonely sandbar for cycling, four lotus field. That's generally how I figure out if a deck is budget. By the way, as I look at the mana base, like if this was playing four. Four Scalding Tarn, yeah, two story. Steam Vents, you know, two Flooded Strand, just and the then tarns like alone. What are, two Fiery Islets. It's not a budget deck. But I, this this mana base with two Shiv and Reef and is, three Spire Bluff Canal, that's budget. What's Tarn now? 100? 80? Um, something like that. I mean, the big thing is this is a deck that you only have one red spell and your Lotus it's Field true. can cast it. So why artificially lower your life total by playing fetches and shots? Well, I feel like when you're splashing, a lot of the time fetches are what help you do it because you can fetch your one steam vents because most of the time you want islands, but you need access to red mana when you need it. I mean, I guess the one benefit of this deck that makes me think that you don't necessarily need that is uh, that Lotus Field taps for red mana. So you just, I mean, you just keyed into the most so, important So let's talk the about the point, the point of the deck. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the point of the deck is the Lotus Field. You have a ton of instants uh, and sorceries that untap target permanent so that you can play them for one or two mana untap your lotus field and generate mana. lotus field isn't standard right now it's a it's a land i believe it enters the battlefield tapped as hexproof when it enters the battlefield you need to sacrifice two other lands you control uh and it taps for three mana of any one color it's a throwback to lotus veil a card from weatherlight uh which obviously is a throwback to black lotus but um this is a card that Basically, the whole premise of this is that the old tap or untap target permanent twiddle effect can be spliced onto arcane through various different effects, uh, and you just untap the thing a million times, and you play lots and lots of card selection spells, many of which are from Kamigawa. Yeah, Ideas Unbound, because it's an arcane card draw spell. It's blue, blue, draw three, and then at the end of turn, you discard three. Peer you through depths. the three if you're winning that turn, so. Well, Reach Through Mist, Peer Through Depths, and Ideas Unbound, they're all arcane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you have... Right, and Psychic Puppetry is the card that you're splicing because it splices for one blue to untap or untap target permanent. So all these card selection spells you're getting either for free or you're netting mana if you have the Psychic Puppetry to untap. And then you find the Psychic Puppetry by just spending your early turns just playing them. You just play, you know, and probably not Ideas Inbound, but you play, um, you know, your Serum Vision Sleight of Hand to find the cards. You play, you can play, um, what's the card you just said? Reach through... Reach through the mess, peer through oh, oh, there it is. Peer through depths, reach through mess. You can just cycle them, basically, to try and find your psychic puppetry. Once you have your psychic puppetry, now all these arcane cards are just free. And you also have to find your... your um, card name. Lotus. Your Lotus Field. Yeah. I, I almost said Lotus Veil, and that was all I could think of, and I knew it was yeah. wrong. There's a couple cards in here that are really cool. Um, Vizier of Tumbling Sand, that's the tap or untap, uh, and it, what it has... Cycling for two. When you cycle it, you tap or untap target yeah. permanent. So, so it's another way to basically... It's like a cantripping paradic ritual if you yeah. have a Lotus Field in play. But it also is like a creature. You can just play it out and yeah. untap your Lotus Field later if you want. A couple one-ofs you have in here. Uh, there's a one-of of a Merchant Scroll, which is a, cl- that's a classic uh, wonky tutor. So it's one blue, one colorless sorcery. It was from actually... Homelands? From Homelands. It's the best card in Homelands. It was printed <laughs> into 8th edition at Uncommon. Um, so there's a weird white border version you can play in Modern, and it's Search your library for a blue instant card. Put it into your hand. Um, so that's a one cool card. And then another Psychic sweet- Puppetry is a blue instant, notably. Yep. And then one other sweet tutor you have in here is you're playing a single copy of Teleria West, which is a favorite land originally from Future Sight that gets played in the Amulet decks. Uh, it has Transmute for blue, blue, one. Search your library for a card. It's a uh, same mana cost. favorite card of the cast. Yes. Alex loves that card. I love that card. And it searches for your uh, your Lotus, uh, bl- bl- field. Lotus Field. I know. Field. We're never going to get it. Yeah. Um, so this deck is pretty sweet. It's definitely kind of funny. It's a little wonky, but I like the one shimmer of possibility too. I like that that's showing up in some of these janky decks. It was a, it's a Guilds of Ravnica card. It's two mana sorcery uh, for look at the top four cards of your library. I uh, put one in your hand, the rest in the bottom. Okay, yeah, yeah. But two mana to look at four cards is a pretty good rate. Classically, Impulse did that uh, in from Visions and at instant it, speed. At instant speed, so this is worse than Impulse, but it's. The same number of cards for the same amount of mana. So if you don't necessarily care about doing it on your opponent's turn, it's the same thing. Is it really the same thing? Yeah. It's not like a non-land or something like that? No. It's exactly the same. Only it's a yeah, it's just a sorcery. Huh. How did I miss the fact that Shimmer Possibility was that good? That's hilarious. I know. I know. Well, because most cards look at three, right? You have Telling Time that looks at three. You have Anticipate yeah. that looks at three. Those are both instants. So if you're interested in instants, you play them. And like decks like Scape Shift that are l- sometimes looking to play one of that effect will still play it. Well, when you just said it looked at four, I was like, oh, yeah, Impulse looks at five. And I was like, no, 
No. Peer through peer through depths does actually look at five, but it doesn't get it, it gets only an incident or sorcery. Yeah, so, yeah, so if you're looking for a lotus field, peer through depths is not the best, but it is arcane. I mean, fifty percent of this deck is just a storm deck. It's half the cards in yeah. here are just storm cards. It's yeah. just doing something else pretty cool that takes advantage now. It doesn't use the graveyard, of your which lotus is one field. big benefit. Well, it, it is playing. No, it does because you're playing you're you're playing four copies of um what's it called. Pass and Flames. Two copies. You're playing of two copies of Pass and Flames, but you don't necessarily need it. Okay. The way that Storm typically needs it. So this is another 5-0 list. I want to jump now to the Perseal 5-0 five color elementals list. We've been talking on the cast for a while now. Uh, you know, one of my favorite lands, weird lands, is the Morning Tide land, um, Primal Beyond, which is a uh, land that when it enters the battlefield, it enters untapped. If you reveal an elemental card, taps for a colorless. It also taps to add one man of any color to your mana pool that you can use to cast elemental spells or activate abilities of elementals. And so uh, because now there are a bunch of sweet new elementals that have been pushed with the new set, we actually have a five-color elementals list that is uh, doing work. And I know you play elementals in standard. Yeah, I've been playing uh, teamer ramp elementals with Nissas and stuff. Um, and so one of the big strengths of the deck is uh, Risen Reef, which is in this deck as a four of. Um, Risen Reef, just like it, if you pl- you play it and it, it, auto, it can trips. Sometimes it ramps you because when it enters the battlefield, you whenever it or another elemental enters the battlefield, you look at the top card of your library. Uh, if it is a land, you may put it into play tapped, if, and then uh, otherwise you put it into your hand. So throw back to the card Coiling Oracle, right? It's the exact same effect. Uh, no, Coiling Oracle, you reveal the card, so your opponent always knows what it is, even if you put it in your hand. Uh, okay. Also, if it's a land, you must put it into play tapped. One thing that's interesting about Risen Reef is sometimes you play it or another elemental when you have no lands in your hand and you haven't played a land this turn and you see a land you just put it in your hand so you can play it untapped oh interesting yeah. so That's cool. <laughs> you know it is better than coiling oracle but it does cost one more mana uh the upside is that it's whenever it or any elemental enters the battlefield so um if you get to untap with it you can play like one or two elementals and each one is digging you closer to more risen reefs and sometimes you just have two risen reefs in play and you just start like ripping through your deck so fast. You're putting lands into play and you just totally go off. So the reason that I, you know, you're able to really maximize it in modern because you have Flamekin Harbinger to put cards on top, which you can then draw with the Risen Reef. So with Flamekin Harbinger, you can play it with the Risen Reef in play. You can put whatever card you want on top of your deck or whatever elemental you want on top of your deck and then draw it off the Reef trigger. And is Flamekin and Harbinger a, a one, one for one? It's a one, one for one. Yeah. yeah. For one red. Searches for an elemental, puts it on the top of your library. But if you have a Risen Reef in play and you play the Harbinger, you can, you know, stack the triggers so that you get to draw the elemental immediately. Um, then it's also playing four Thunderkin Awakener, which is the one, two, Super dope. one, two haste. Whenever it attacks, put a creature with toughness less than it's. So one toughness, basically, since it's a one, two, unless you're buffing it um, in, onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking and Risen Reef has one toughness. Um, <laughs> and, but you have to sacrifice it on the turn, but because all of your elementals, the way that they work, that you're getting value when they either enter or leave the battlefield, for the most part, um, you get to really take advantage of that. You get a lot of value out of putting, even like a Vesper Lark. You put a Vesper Lark onto the battlefield, and then at the end of turn it leaves, and you get another thing back. Because yeah. Vesper Lark triggers on leaving, not dying. Yeah, and Vesper Lark is also in this deck. It also gets back Risen Reef, because it gets back a creature with power, one or less. So... Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like this is a deck that somebody built to maximize Risen Reef. And having played the card in Standard, I think it is a card that is worth trying to maximize. It, it's a little slow for Modern, I think. Um, but this person 5 0 so they they obviously are doing it right. Uh, four Aether Vial in the deck. Yep. And four main deck Leyland of the Void. Uh, I guess the deck, if your deck's Ho- Hogak matchup is bad enough in this metagame, sometimes you just bite the bullet. I will say that it has enough card advantage that like having Leyland, drawing Leyland of the Void in a matchup board's dead is probably fine because your Risen Reef will bail you out. Yeah, I think um, something we've been talking about on here for a while, ever since the Humans deck first broke through like a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, we talked with Corey Burkhardt on the show a bunch back then about it, kind of getting his opinion about why he thought it was so potent. And one, one thing he and I talked about, I remember, was just there's now enough support for these five-color tribal decks that if you can find an angle that's cool, you can make it work. Yeah. I mean, Humans is the best one. But you can easily play five color slivers. People do it. You can play five color yeah. mentals. Just unclaimed territory and cavern of souls alone make it so that almost any five color an ancient ziggurat, an ancient ziggurat. Right. You can just do it. I mean, all you have to do is figure out is there some angle that nobody's seeing with this tribe, and I can make this work. Right. And what's nice about elementals and uh, slivers in particular is they have another five color land. In this case, primal beyond, but yep. uh, slivers have sliver hive. Right. So yeah, I mean. 
th- so so this you know, I think it takes something to make tribal decks work in modern and humans has it in disruption. They just have tons of disruptive two drops. And like you said, two drop is a pretty important turn in modern. And, you know, if your two drop is meddling major kite, sail freebooter or Thalia, um, you're putting your opponent on the back foot starting on turn two. And that's the value of humans because your other humans continue to do so as, you know, reflect your mage or more copies of those cards or whatever. Um, this deck is not doing that. It's not really interacting with your opponent as much. Uh, but what it is doing is, is drawing tons of cards. So this is a deck that's looking to grind you out using value from Voice of Resurgence, recurring their creatures with Thunderkin Awakener and Vesper Lark, you know, drawing tons of cards off of Risen Reef. Uh, it's playing one Omnath, Locus of the Royal, to deal Sick. a little bit of extra damage, one Flicker Wisp to get rebuy ETBs. Um, it's playing Creeping Trailblazer kind of as a win condition. That guy's a 2-2 two, two for 2 that gives all your elementals plus one plus O. Oh, it's just basically can, a Lord that got printed. Yeah, it's a Lord. Um, it's just two mana lord. So that's more of a win condition than anything else. That's the the champion of the parish of this deck, if you will, or Thali's lieutenant. Um, but yeah, this deck is just looking to draw a ton of cards and use these like recursive um, value engines to kind of um, grind your opponent out as opposed to just disrupting them until you beat them up. Yeah, so there's only a couple left here that I want to talk about. You know, there's definitely some pretty fun stuff going on in Modern. We've talked about now, you know, a weird combo deck. We've talked about, uh, I guess, sort of another weird combo deck. We've talked about a tribal deck. Now I want to talk about Scred Red. I see there's a version of Scred Red here that's 5-0. Truly a classic. Classic. Um, and the, this one is by Adon... Uh, Adon <laughs> Adonis 2K. There Adonis being a Greek mythological figure. I struggled with that one. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is also playing for Arkham's Astrolabe, which is hilarious considering it's a red mono red deck, correct? Yep, it is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're playing Snowlands, and I guess you, basically it's like um, you just want to play four less cards in your deck. It is playing six colorless lands as well. So it does fix your mana a little bit uh, off of like a Frostwalk Bastion or a Scrying Sheets. So this deck is playing three of each. Uh, you can cast an Astrolabe off of them with a colorless snow mana. Does Scred reference... you can filter that into red. Scred references snow permanence, correct? It is. It's, yeah. For each snow permanent you control, or deal deal damage to target creature equal to the number of snow permanents you control. Right, and Astrolabe reads. is another snow permanent. Yeah, so it's interesting um, because Scred is like the only snow deck that existed using only cold snap cards before yeah. Modern Horizons got printed. So it's interesting because this is like the updated Scred based on the Modern Horizons card. So it's got the Astrolabe as an additional snow permanent, right, for Scred that also fixes your mana a little bit, and it just filters through your deck. Um, it's got Frostwalk Bastion, which is the, the creature land that's a snow land. So this allows all uh, 22 of your lands to be snow lands, um, but you still get to play a creature land, so you're not playing like Gitu Encampment. It's better than Gitu Encampment anyway. but Way better. Um, <laughs> And then the the scrying sheets will help you more consistently hit your land drops uh, since you all 22 of your lands are snow lands. And then um, it's also playing Chandra Awakened Inferno and two Karn Scion of Urza and three Karn the Great Creator. So it's playing an entire mostly colorless Planeswalker suite of five different Karns, whereas these decks used to play um, like Chandra Pyre Master, Koth of the Hammer. Um, these colorless Planeswalkers have kind of stepped in and just been better generally than the four mana red Planeswalkers. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the Karn Great Creator combo goes along with Micah Synth Lattice in the sideboard, which is a thing people do now, which is a hard lock on your opponent. Yep, and the deck is also playing four Mind Stone to play the turn turn three Karn, Karn yep. potentially. Really powerful. Um, it's also playing three Season Pyromancer from Modern Horizons, um, which is, you know, just a good value red card. Yeah, and also three Pia and Kira and Nalar, which makes artifacts um, yep. and is another way for you to... Yep, with the Mind Stone, you can play it on turn three. You know, you want a good number of four drops if you're playing Mind Stone because Mind Stone ramps you to four. And if you can spend all four of your mana on turn three, you're probably going to be ahead unless your opponent is doing something very fast. Now, finally, this deck is playing three copies of Blood Moon in the main. Now, one of the things that I think is so interesting about the Blood Moon plan is that because of the prominence of Prismatic Vista and Snowlands, Blood Moon doesn't feel like as good of a main deck play as it used to feel. Um, now, obviously, if you get Blood Moon down and they play Prismatic Vista, you're happy because that's just a basic. But if they even can get ahead of you by two turns, which is often what's going to happen, a lot of the decks now will have two basic lands by the time you hit turn three. So it doesn't actually feel like as proactive of a strategy as it once did. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think that the format is somewhat dominated still by Phoenix Hogak humans, and Blood Moon is great against all of them. Yep, true. Um, Because Phoenix is not playing very many basics. Like, if they see the Blood Moon coming, they can play around it by fetching because they're playing tons of fetch lands. Um, 
they can fetch for basics, but like the deck is really looking for red, blue dual lands most of the time, I'm pretty sure. So interesting. All right, guys, we're wrapping it up here. We There's a couple of lists that I wanted to talk about uh, we didn't get to. There's there a couple. An, there was an eight uh, Spore Frog deck at the GP. It's not on these lists because these, okay. are, these are five O's. <laughs> but I, I posted in our Masters of Modern group chat. Uh, Channel Fireball did a deck, lit, deck tech on some cool decks uh, from the weekend uh, just to kind of highlight, you know, non-Hogak stuff that's cool. Uh, but it's, it's effectively, it's more or less a, a Martyr Proclamation deck where okay. it's, so it's playing four Soul Warden, four Essence Warden, uh, four Johnny's Pride Mate, four Sarah Ascendant, and then four Ranger Captain of Eos, which is the new... Sick, yeah, the three yeah. drop. Yep. But one thing you can search for with your Ranger Captain of Eos is Spore Frog, <laughs> or Kami of False Hope, which is a white version of Spore Frog. Oh my god. And then it's playing four Mimic Vat. This is a 61 card deck that the guy was playing in the GP. So, so, you, know you, can, so you can sack your Spore Frog, your so Mimic Vat? you know vat? he's memeing. <laughs> we'll see. So the Mimic Vat, you can put Spore Frog on it, and then you can fog every single turn. Uh, so instead of martyring every single turn with proclamation, you're looking to Spore Frog every single Mimic turn. Mimic Vat, Spore Frog. Just, just, just the stone cold nuts. Um, amazing. Yeah, Asian. so I wanted to highlight that deck on the cast because I thought it was awesome. Uh, Channel Fireball did a deck tech if you want to watch it. You have the you know, the creator of the 61-card masterpiece. Um, there seems to be a homeless person rummaging over in the corner here. <laughs> Hi, guys. Alex it's, is back. It's Alex. He's back from Africa. <laughs> uh, what's up, man? Welcome back. Do you nice. want to do you want to use my microphone so everybody can hear you? Yeah, uh, some fun facts. Uh, a group of z- giraffes is called a tower. It's a tower of giraffes. Tower of giraffes. And a group of zebras is a dazzle of zebras. Huh. That's Aww. nice. Yeah. What are a group of podcast hosts called? Uh, fools. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we just were wrapping up talking about all of our sweet decks here. We talked five color elementals. We talked Scred Red, four color Sahili, uh, the Spore Frog. Pretty sweet. Did you talk about list. the sweet list Michael showed me earlier today of Planeswalkers and Numericals? No, that sounds awesome. Though. No, you can save that for later. Yeah. Okay, we're pocketing that for later. Hip pocket, hip pocket. Um, yeah, so we were just wrapping it up. Welcome back, Alex. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Thanks for watching, as always, and supporting the show. As I mentioned earlier, be sure to like, subscribe, comment, let us know what you wanted to hear. That conversation about modern power levels of cards, I think they're going to bring that back. So if you want to hear more about that, let us know. Be sure to come say what's up in Vegas Friday night. We're doing trivia. It's going to be awesome. Uh, it's going to be a great show. I think you guys are going to have a good time. And Alex and I will be there hanging out all weekend. Yeah, so. there'll be free dragons and free packs at the I'll also be show. There. Alex and Ben will be there. Be there. I'll... I'll also be there. We'll be at the command zone, <laughs> jamming games. Maybe we'll even try to do oh, one of those. Will, we, will I be? I didn't sign up for that. No, I mean, I, okay, cool. Yeah. I won't be. Maybe we'll even try to do one of those. <laughs> I assume you're playing draft. in the event. I am playing in the event. Ben's playing in the event. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'll be oh, in the command zone. Yeah. This I, guy. Maybe we'll even try to do one of those chaos draft things we've done in the past. They're a lot of fun. So, uh, guys, thank you for listening. We will be back same time, same place next week. Um, maybe with the OG crew. I'm not sure, but thanks to Michael, as always, for sitting in as the third host of the show. And uh, yeah, oh, thanks for having me. He's ignoring both Again. of us. Look at that. Look at that. Uh, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you for your attention. See you later, alligator. This has been a production of Time Traveler Media, sending podcasts into the future.